syndrome, a case report. Introduction, Lawrence Moon Bardet Beetle syndrome, autosomal recessive genetic disorder with variable expressivity results from consanguineous marriage. It's a congenital celiopathy manifesting with primary and secondary characteristics. Primary clinical features include rod cone dystrophy, polydactyly, central obesity, general ab genital abnormalities, renal abnormalities and mental retardation. Secondary clinical features include developmental delay, speech abnormalities, ataxia, diabetes mellitus, congenital heart diseases and hepatic fibrosis. The most common clinical feature is retinal dystrophy. The patients generally have an onset of symptoms within first 10 years of life and among them the first complaint is poor night vision. Materials and methods, a 23 years old male patient presented to our OPD at regional high hospital, Karnul, with the complaints of progressive diminution of vision, more marked at night time since childhood, which progresses diminution of vision in daytime at present. History reveals delayed milestone, mild mental retardation, slurred speech, obesity since childhood. He was born of consanguineous marriage. The other male sibling and parents were normal. On general physical examination, he had ma marked obesity, moon-like face. His height is 164 cm and weight is 91 kg and BMI is 33.8 kg per meter square. Polydactyl is seen in both hands and feet. On ophthalmological examination, visual acuity is counting fingers close to face in both eyes. Nystagmus is seen in both eyes. Anterior segment is normal in both eyes. Here the picture shows that there is a obesity with moon faces and polydactyly of hands and feet. Fundus examination shows clear media, pale waxy disc, arterial attenuation and pigmentary lesion in macula. And peripheral retina shows bony spicule suggestive of retinitis pigmentosa. Other systemic examination reveals no abnormality. Lab investigation include complete blood, pic blood picture, ESR, RFT, LFT, ultrasound abdomen, ECG and blood sugar level. LH and testosterone reveals normal. Lipid profile shows hyperlipidemia. Thyroid function test reveals hypothyroidism. As the patient is having retinitis pigmentosa, obesity, polydactyly, mild mental retardation, so the provisional diagnosis is Lawrence Moon Bardet Beetle syndrome was made. Discussion Lawrence Moon Bardet Beetle syndrome was first defined by Bardet in 1922 as an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by structural and functional abnormalities of organs and tissue with a diverse embryonic derivation. The five cardinal features. It imposes co conclusion, it imposes considerable morbidity and mortality. A prompt evaluation can able to better diagnose and manage this condition. Since most of the cases are associated with the consanguineous marriages, the affected families should undergo genetic counseling. Good afternoon everyone, I am Dr. Vai Roja from NRIMS Visakhapatnam. I am going to present a poster on adystonic pupil in a rare case of Ross syndrome. Introduction. Ross syndrome is a rare disorder of the peripheral nervous system that is characterized by triad of tonic pupil, reduced or loss of deep tendon reflexes and anhydrosis or hypohydrosis. The tonic pupil stems from damage to the ciliary ganglion or postganglionic parasympathetic nerve fibers. Loss of deep tendon reflexes due to damage of the dorsal root ganglia or spinal interneuron loss. A 53-year-old male presented with a complaint of pain abdomen since one week, generalized weakness since three months, heat intolerance and decreased sweating since three months, defective vision both eyes since one year, past history, history of diabetes mellitus since 12 years, known alcoholic since 30 years, on examination right eye, uncorrected visual acuity is 4 by 60 with best correction 6 by 12, cornea is clear, anterior chamber is normal, iris is normal, pupil sluggish reacting, lens IMSC, IOP is 14 mm Hg. Left eye, uncorrected visual acuity is 2 by 60 with best correction 6 by 24. Cornea is clear, anterior chamber is normal, iris is normal. Pupil is sluggish reacting, lens is IMSE and IOP 16 mm Hg. Anisocoria and light near dissoci dissociation is present. Fundus examination, early cataract changes, otherwise normal. Systemic examination, gastrointestinal dysfunction is present, cerebellar signs and spine were normal. Motor system examination, right side, tone and power is normal, biceps, triceps, supinator, knee and ankle reflexes were depressed and planters were mute. Left side, tone and power is normal, biceps, triceps, supinator, knee and ankle reflexes were depressed and planters were mute. On darkroom examination, the size of the pupil and right and left eye is 4 mm respectively. On room light and bright light examination, there is no change in the size of the pupil. On near effort, the size of the pupil constricted in right eye is 3 mm and left eye to 2 mm. On adding 0.125% pilocarpine, the size of the pupil of both eyes constricted to 2 mm. Differential diagnosis, Harlequin syndrome and Horner syndrome. Diagnosis, adystonic pupil in Ross syndrome. Investigations. Routine investigations like hemogram, urine examination and thyroid profile were normal. VDRL was non-reactive. Chest X-ray and MRI spine detected no abnormality.
On adding pilocarpin 0.125%, there was constriction of both pupils. Discussion. The tonic pupil produces variable anisocoria that is worse in the light than in the dark. The pupil reaction to light is typically impaired but preserved to accommodation stimulus. The denervated sphincter muscles can show increased sensitivity to diluted pilocarpine due to upregulation of receptors. Conclusion. Ross syndrome including the triad of tonic pupil, variable anhydrosis and areflexia. Other autonomic nervous system involvement including GIT, cardiac system should be evaluated in Ross syndrome. The autonomic thermo dysregulation may be potentially dangerous and countermeasures to prevent overheating are recommended for symptomatic patients. Thank you. Good morning everyone. My poster presentation is on a case report of neurofibromatosis type 1. Purpose to study a case of neurofibromatosis type 1. Introduction. It is characterized by neuroectodermal tumors arising within multiple organs. It is an auto autosomal dominant inheritance. The frequency is estimated to be 1 is to 4000. It is often inherited but 30 to 50 percent occurs as a mutation in NF1 gene located at chromosome 17. Case report, a 16-year-old female patient came to ophthalmology OPD for routine eye examination. Her general physical examination revealed multiple cephalate macules with diameter more than 5 mm and two neurofibromas, one on forearm and one on chest. On slit lamp examination, multiple small oval yellow-brown fleshy papules randomly spaced all over the iris are seen. Her parents were given genetic counseling regarding the neurofibromatosis type 1. First image showing macules over the neck region. Second image showing no neurofibroma over the extensor aspect of the forearm. Third image showing multiple leash nodules over the iris. Discussion manifestations of neurofibromatosis have been observed for a long time before being described by Robert William Smith. The classic description is by a German pathologist Frederick Daniel von Recklinghausen who accurately described the diverse findings as a single entity, thus the condition is often referred to as von Recklinghausen disease. Leash nodules are the most common ophthalmological manifestations of NF1 and are included in the clinical diagnostic criteria. Conclusion, this is a typical case of NF1. In such case, a detailed patient investigation is required because of possibility of generalized involvement of other organs. Proper clinical and genealogical analysis is important for determination of genetic risks and prognosis of relatives of proband. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. O. Daishtri. Today's topic is clinical study and profile of ocular trauma at Regional Eye Hospital, Karnul. Introduction, a significant number of blindness cases worldwide are related to ocular trauma. Over 2 million cases of ocular trauma are reported every year, of which 40,000 result in significant vision loss. Trauma can cause injuries to globe, optic nerve, and adnex of the eye, and these range from superficial to vision-threatening complications. Hence, to facilitate proper communication between ophthalmologists and planned clinical trials in the field of ocular trauma, the ocular trauma score has been developed. There are variety of ocular injuries, including minor ones such as subconjunctival hemorrhage that does not affect vision, and more severe ones such as globe rupture or retinal detachment. Globe injuries are classified into two types. One is open and closed. P 
people living in rural areas are more often uninformed about protective glasses such as goggles and shields agriculture work and handling of animals are also major cause of eye injuries objectives are we aim to document the clinical spectrum of ocular injuries among patients presenting to regional eye hospital karnool and methods of hospital based prospective study over a period of 5 months from february 2020 to june 2022 inclusion criteria is between ages of 1 to 18 years and exclusion criteria is less than 1 year and greater than 80 years which is thermal injuries ultrasonic injuries radiation injuries clinical injuries orbital injuries with fractures or excluded in results most commonly involved age group is 31 to 40 years and most commonly involved is male and most common injury subtype is black eye followed by subconjunctival hemorrhage which is followed by lid lacerations followed by lid abrasions and most common mode of injury is road traffic accident and most common cause of trauma is fall these are the some of the picture representing the corneal scleral tears lid tears corneal abrasions and berlin's edema blunt trauma with traumatic cataract coming to the discussion this study involved 60 patients with ocular trauma who presented to regional eye hospital karnool in our study majority of the ocular trauma patients were in a age group of 31 to 40 years in our study males are constituted around 88.33% the most common etiology encountered was falls due to road traffic accidents ocular trauma can lead to serious sight and eye threatening consequences accurate history taking and observation including good primary ocular first aid and prompt referral of serious eye injuries to an emergency department with access to ophthalmology services there are many possible causes of ocular trauma ocular injury can occur at any age but is more common in adults the visual outcome depends upon the site size of injury the counseling of farmers regarding the usage of protective goggles at works and education of parents and teachers regarding the prevention of ocular injuries in children may go a long way in reducing the visual morbidity from ocular trauma the clinicians must determine whether a patient with ocular trauma can be reassured or instead requires urgent referral to the local emergency department for further investigation thank you Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Chukal Sri Krishna Soumya. Today's uh, my poster is about a rare case of renal coloboma syndrome with double disc sign. A 15 years old female child, a known case of uh, chronic kidney disease stage three, since six months, diagnosed with metabolic bone disorder and iron deficiency anemia, referred to ophthalmology department from the pediatrics department for fundus examination. On general examination, pallor is present. Patient has difficulty in walking. On ocular examination, visual acuity in right eye is six by six, and in left eye is six by six partial. Anterior segment is normal in both eyes. Fundus reveals media, optic disc, blood vessels, and macula appears normal in the right eye. Background shows a horizontally oval, hypopigmented, depressed lesion of half disc diameter, seen inferior to the disc through which retinal blood vessels are passing, showing the double disc sign, suggestive of the choroidal coloboma in the right eye. Fundus of the left eye is normal. Ocular investigations include IOP measured by applanation tonometer in right eye is 12 mm Hg and in left eye 14 mm Hg. Axial length measured using the scan of right eye is 22.84 mm and the left eye is 22.75 mm. B scan of the right eye is normal and OCT macula of right eye is normal. This is the B scan of right eye which appears to be normal. This is a macula. Uh, OCT of macula which appears to be normal and this is a OCT at the coloboma site which shows a depressed crater with the devoid of the choroidal tissue suggestive of choroidal coloboma hematological investigations shows increased intact parathormone level serum alkaline phosphate serum urea creatine chloride levels decreased levels of serum calcium and hemoglobin were observed with the raised esr levels Radiological investigations include ultrasound abdomen showing grade two renal parenchymal changes. Chest X-ray shows pseudo fracture of right clavicle. X-ray hip joints, pubic diastosis, and uh, proximal neck of femur fracture with decreased bone density. MRI lower limbs shows grade two renal rickets changes. All these are suggestive of renal osteodystrophy changes. Discussion: So renal coloboma syndrome, also called as papillorenal syndrome, is a rare autosomal dominant congenital anomaly, primarily affecting kidney and eye development. People with this condi condition typically have kidneys that are small and underdeveloped hypoplastic which leads to the end stage renal disease. The eye anomalies include optic nerve anomalies like optic nerve coloboma and optic nerve dysplasia, choroidal coloboma, macular dysplasia with varying degrees of visual impairment. Conclusion patient with double disc sign needs to be screened for renal pathology. Large choroidal coloboma with intercalary membrane needs prophylactic barrage laser to prevent a retinal detachment. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Siddiq. Today, I am going to present a case of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. A 50-year-old female patient presented with downward displacement and forward protrusion of the left eye, which is in serious in onset, painless, gradually progressive since one year, along with the bilateral enlargement at parotid gland area. She has a history of weight loss and fever. On general examination, she was moderately built and nourished. Her vitals were normal. On ocular examination, the facial symmetry was abnormal due to proptosis, and her head posture was normal. Extraocular movements were full and free in all directions. On examination, best corrected visual acuity of right eye was 6 by 18, IUV was 15 millimeters mercury, lids were normal, anterior segment was normal, and fundus was normal. On examination in the left eye, best corrected visual acuity was 6 by 9, IOB was 16 mm HG. She had an upper lid tosis of 2 mm in the left eye, anterior segment was normal, fundus was normal. On palpation, there was a soft tissue mass which was formed and appeared as an S shaped mass superior laterally. On exophthalmometry, right eye was 21 mm and left eye was 26 mm. She was advised CT. In CT orbit, on coronal view, soft tissue mass was seen in a supralateral aspect, probably lacrimal gland tumor. Left eye anterior arbitratomy was performed. The mass was excised and sent for histopathological examination. In histopathology, a capsulated and lobulated tissue with monotonous proliferation of lymphocytes was observed, probably non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Probable diagnosis, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that originates in the eye falls somewhere in middle in terms of external cancers making up to 8 to 10 percent of all non-Hodgkin's extranodal lymphomas. As a whole, however, it is a very rare occurrence, accounting for less than 1 percent of all cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Ocular adnexal lymphoma is considered primary if it involves ocular adnex alone and secondary if it is accompanied by a lymphoma of identical type at another side. The majority of the lesions in this area are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 80 percent of which arise from B lymphocytes, 14 percent from T cells and 6 percent from natural killer cells. Prognosis depends on the subtype, staging, a person's age and other factors. Across all subtypes, a five-year survival was seen up to 71 percent, and it can range from 81 percent for stage one to 61 percent for stage four disease. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Shabihana, second year postgraduate. I'm going to present a case report of Ramsey Hunt syndrome. A 62-year-old male came with chief complaints of inability to close his left eye, defective vision for both far and near, and pain from 15 days. On local examination, face bilaterally asymmetrical, absence of forehead wrinkles on left side, deviation of mouth towards right side. On ocular examination, right eye vision 612 partial with pinhole 69 with IMSE, left eye vision 636 with pinhole 624 with heel scars present at eyebrow, eyelid and skin around eye associated with incomplete closure of eyelid. In left eye, conjunctival and circumciliary congestion with corneal ulcer of size 6 into 1 mm with horizontal branching zigzag in shape from 3 to 8, 8 o'clock in the lower half of pupillary area with IMSE. On CNS examination, 5th nerve decreased corneal sensations in left eye, 7th nerve absence of forehead wrinkles, inability to close eyelid against resistance on left side, inability to puff cheek, inability to smile and deviation of mouth towards right side. 8th nerve hearing loss is noted. This is a PO2 and audiometry showing sensory neural hearing loss. Treatment given includes tab acyclovir 800 mg, tab methyl prednisolone 40 mg, eye ointment acyclovir 3%, eye ointment carboxymethyl cellulose with eye drops home atropine, eye drops tobramycin with low prednol, eye drops carboxymethyl cellulose, lid taping and physiotherapy was given. Ramsey Hunt syndrome, also known as herpes joster roticus, is a classical triad of ipsilateral facial nerve paralysis, otalgia, sensory neural hearing loss, and a vesicular rash along the involved nerve dis distribution. RHS is a late complication of varicella joster virus infection that results in inflammation of geniculate ganglion of 7th cranial nerve. Diagnosis is often missed or delayed, which can lead to long-term complications like post-herpetic neuralgia. This is a picture showing after four weeks of treatment, corneal ulcer was healed. My conclusion is early diagnosis and proper management of RHS should be done for early recovery and, and to prevent long-term complications. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Baby Manjusha, second year postgraduate from MIMS, and I'm going to present about the topic pizza pie appearance. The cytomegalovirus retinitis is an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, a related opportunistic infection that can lead to sight threatening ocular infection. It is caused by cytomegalovirus, a double standard DNA virus in the herpes viridae family, and risk factors include HIV, CD4 count less than 50, or systemic 
severe systemic immunosuppression. It is often associated with HIV, AIDS, and was extremely rare prior to the AIDS epidemic. It is also associated with severe immunosuppression from chemotherapy and autoimmune conditions requiring immunomodulators. CMV retinitis occurred with higher frequency prior to the advent of antiretroviral therapy, but has since been decreasing in well-developed countries, and although still remains a prevalent condition in developing countries. CMV retinitis is a full thickness retinal infection that can lead to necrosis and retinal breaks and detachments. And CMV reaches the retina hematogenously and infects the vascular endothelium, which then spreads to the retinal cells. An impaired CD4 cell function permits uncontrolled CMV replication. Patients with CD4 counts less than 50 cells per mm cube should be seen at least every three months to screen for CMV retinitis, as active retinitis is typically asymptomatic. So a 47-year-old uh, man visited to the Department of uh, Ophthalmology Tertiary Care Hospital Vijayanagaram, presented with the complaints of pain and redness of both eyes since 20 days, associated with defective vision for both near and distance vision. He is a known case of AIDS with a poor drug compliance. On examination, his best corrected visual acuity was a perception of light in the right eye and hand movements in the left eye. And conjunctiva was quiet in both the eyes. And cornea has pre keratic precipitates in both the eyes. Anterior chamber was of von Herrick's grading 4 in both the eyes. And pupil was normal in size and reacting to light in both the eyes. On fundus examination, we could see, we could see a pale disc, vascular attenuation with perivascular white lesions, and flame-shaped hemorrhages resembling pizza pie appearance in both the eyes. So the IOP recorded with uh, applanation tonometry at 10.30 a.m. was about 14 mm of HG in the right eye and 16 mm of HG in the left eye. So these are the pictures. In the right eye, we, could, we can see the keratic precipitates in the left eye, also keratic precipitates. And the fundus picture showing flame-shaped hemorrhages with perivascular white fluffy lesions, indicative of necrosis resembling pizza pie appearance. The CD4 count of the patient is 35 cells per milliliter. So the patient was diagnosed with CMB retinitis, both the eyes, and these are my references. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Joyce, and I am presenting a case of Foster Candy syndrome. Foster Candy syndrome is characterized by visual loss due to compressive optic atrophy in one eye and papillary mind control lateral eye brought on by increased incre intracranial pressure. The underlying cause of this condition is the presence of an intracranial space occupying lesion that compresses the ipsilateral optic nerve which gives rise to optic atrophy. The lesion can also cause increased intracranial pressure thus explaining the papilledema in the fellow eye found in Foster Candy syndrome. Risk factors include prior radiation exposure, female gender, NF type 2 and weight gain. Case report, a 52-year-old male with a history of gradual painless loss of vision in right eye associated with headache, not associated with redness or floaters, not associated with ocular trauma. On general examination, he is moderately built and nourished. Systemic examination was normal. Ocular examination, the visual acuity is in right eye is no perception of light and in left eye, it is 624. With pinhole, there is no improvement of vision in both eyes. Anterior segment, everything is normal except sluggish pupillary reactions in both eyes. IOP in right eye it is 24 and left eye 25 millimeters of mercury. On dilated funnel examination, right eye shows glow present, media is clear, pale disc with normal visuals and dull foveal left reflex. In left eye, glow is present, media is clear, margins are blur with uh, normal vessels and dull foveal, foveal reflex. Investigations, fundus ophthalmoscopy, visual field testing, OCT, brain and orbital MRI and CT shows uniformly enhancing base of skull mass lesion consistent with a frontal spinoid meningioma with dimensions of 4.6 cm into 3.5 cm into 4.9 cm. This is the fundus picture showing ipsilateral optic atrophy and contralateral papilledema. The MRI shows uh, both axillary sections and sagittal sections shows um, a well circumscribed homogeneous mass compressing right frontal lobe and displacing the fox and left frontal lobe. In sagittal section uh, uh, shows uh, compressive mass. Treatment, the patient was placed on oral prednisolone, 60 mg daily tapered to 40 mg daily for one week, then tapered to 20 mg for another week, finally tapered 10 mg. The differential diagnosis is Foster Candy syndrome. Discussion includes, uh, it is the uh, it includes 1 to 2.5 of all intracranial masses associated with progressive vision loss, ipsilateral anosmia, diplopia, headache, nausea and vomiting. And the treatment includes uh, medical and surgical management. Medical management includes uh, steroid therapy and surgical man management includes radiotherapy and surgical resection. Conclusion, it is a rapidly evolving insidious condition. Routine examination.
the prognosis largely depends on extent of intracranial space activating lesions thank you Good afternoon to all. I am Dr. Rakesh. I am presenting a case of ocular manifestations of treacher Collin syndrome. So introduction, treacher Collin syndrome or mandibulofacial dysostosis is a rare genetic disorder characterized by distinctive abnormalities of head and face. Craniofacial abnormalities tend to involve the underdevelopment of zygomatic complex, maxilla, mandible, palate and mouth which can lead to breathing and feeding difficulties. In addition, patients can have man malformations of eye and anomalies in external and middle ear structures which may lead to hearing loss. The incidence is 1 in 50,000 live birth. The syndrome is named after an eminent British ophthalmologist Edward Treasure Collin who described the essential features of the syndrome in 1900. TCS is caused by mutations of TCOF1, POLR1B, POLR1C, POLR1D genes. TCS affects structures of first and second pharyngeal arches. TCS is having variable penetrance and expressivity. It affects male and female in equal numbers. Ocular findings include colobomas, especially of lid, antimangaloid slant, microphthalmia, strabismus, ectropion, sparsity of eyelashes, nasolacrimal duct obstruction, limbal and orbital dermoid, high astigmatism, corneal opacity, cataract, etc. Case report, a 28-year-old female patient was referred from Department of ENT with complaints of defective vision of left eye since childhood. On examination, distinctive abnormalities of head and face was noted. Hypertelorism, hypoplasia of zygomatic bone and maxilla, congenital melanocytic nevus, parrot beak nose, small ears, high arched palate, malposition of teeth were noted. Systemic examination was within normal li limits. On ocular examination, a right eye was found to be normal with 6 6 vision and normal fundus. Left eye was having visual acuity of only counting fingers close to face. In left eye, microphthalmia, esotropia, sparsity of eyebrows and lashes, partial coloboma of lid, ectropion of lower lid, symblophron of upper, li upper lid involving the cornea, macular corneal opacity with superficial corneal vascularization and total cataract was noted. B scan revealed traction retinal detachment. Conservative treatment and counseling was given. These are the pictures of the patient. And this is the right eye fundus normal with a left eye having total cataract and RB. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Priyanka, postgraduate from Government Medical College, Anantapur. Here is a case report of a rare case of ocular manifestations of lamellar ichthyosis. Uh, the history is a six-year-old female child presented with watering and photophobia since birth. Marriage, it's a first-degree consanguineous type, first child. General examination showing dryness of skin with scales, referred to pediatrics and dermatology department. Ocular examination showing uh, right eye bilateral, uh, both eyes uh, bilateral ectropion uh, with lag of thalamus present in both eyes. Slit lamp examination showing exposure keratitis in the inferior cornea of about 2 mm and uh, T bud suggesting of dry eyes and shimmers test showing 5 to 10 mm of wetting in both eyes. Fundus examination normal uh, in both eyes. Systemic examination normal. Uh, the child was diagnosed to have lamellar ichthyosis. Uh, the patient was managed conservatively with the uh, use of hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, eye ointment and carboxymethyl cellulose eye drops. Eye taping was done uh, during sleep hours. Emollients were given for dry skin. To conclude, it's a congenital bilateral ectropion, which is a mostly found ocular manifestation in uh, lamellar ichthyosis. This is the uh, pictures of the patient. Thank you.
నెక్స్ట్ పార్ట్లో ఫస్ట్ ఫస్ట్ నెక్స్ట్ పార్ట్ టూలో ఫస్ట్ యా గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ ఎవ్రీవన్ అండ్ దిస్ ఈస్ అ కేస్ ఆఫ్ అషస్ సిండ్రోమ్ విచ్ ఇస్ కేస్ ఆఫ్ రెటినైటిస్ పిగ్మెంటోజా అసోసియేటెడ్ విత్ సివియర్ బయలేటరల్ సెన్సరీ న్యూరల్ హీరింగ్ లాస్ a 36 year old female born to a non consanguineous couple came to our opd with a history of diminished vision in both eyes more at night since 15 years the history of presenting illness was it was insidious in onset and gradually progressive and painless in nature and also she is associated with difficulty in hearing for over uh, last 10 years there is no significant family history uh, except for the younger brother with similar complaints uh, of difficulty in hearing since 8 years and diminution of vision since 8 uh, years on clinical examination the uncorrected visual acuity is 6 by 16 in both eyes and best corrected being 636 in right eye and 624 uh, in the left eye and these are the ophthalmic uh, ophthalmoscopic findings there is pallor of optic disc thread like arteriolar attenuation with bony spicules uh, of retinal pigmentation in the mid periphery which is a characteristic of retinitis pigmentosa and an ent consultation was done and audiometry showed uh, moderate to severe sensory neural uh, deafness in both the ears Usher syndrome is a heterogeneous autosomal recessive genetic disorder uh, uh, which is associated with visual impairment due to retinitis pigmentosa and hearing loss it's also called hallgren syndrome and it is a, it is a disorder that permanently and severely affects the senses of hearing vision and balance it is mainly of three clinical types depending upon the severity of the uh, severity and the chron chronologicity it is divided into type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 and type 2 being more common type 1 with uh, profound hearing loss a uh, loss of night vision by age uh, by 10 years and balance problems and uh, type 2 people having moderate to severe hearing loss in early childhood loss of night vision by teenage and norm with normal balance and type 3 normal hearing at birth while hearing loss starts in the childhood and loss of night vision by teenage and uh, uh, normal with normal balance treatment of for vision problems there is no cure for uh, usher syndrome low low vision aids and vision rehabilitation can help people with usher syndrome and vitamin a supplements can uh, uh, delay the progress of uh, retinitis pigmentosa and the hearing problems can be treated as such hearing aids or assistive listening devices can be used and cochlear implants can be used at a glance usher syndrome early symptoms include hearing or uh, hearing loss or deafness late symptoms include loss of night vision and uh, peripheral vision diagnosis depending upon the di dilated eye examination hearing test balance test and genetic test treatment includes vision aids vision rehabilitation and hearing aids or cochlear implants thank you good afternoon everyone this is nimsi hadalsa junior resident from guntur medical college today we are going to see a rare case report on leber's congenital amaurosis A 3-year-old male child was brought to ophthalmology OPD by his mother with complaints of defective vision and abnormal eyeball movements in both eyes since 4 months of his age. Family history shows second degree consanguineous marriage on general examination, general developmental delay and hypotonia, central hypotonia is observed. On examination, jerky nystagmus seen in both eyes, visual equity of both eyes uh, not following light but with intact dazzle reflex. On slit lamp, slit lamp examination, the pupils were sluggishly reacting with rest of the anterior segment being normal in both eyes. presence of developmental delay and mri brain showing superior vermis hypoplasia with absent inferior vermis superior cerebellar peduncle giving a molar tooth appearance suggest of zaubert spectrum disorder fundus examination of right eye showed uh, clear media and optic disc being paler cup by disc ratio 0.3 to 1 and arterial arteriolar narrowing is observed foveal reflex being altered and uh, background retina showing mottling Uh, on the left eye the media is clear and the optic disc uh, was pallor cup by disc ratio is 0.3 is to 1 blood vessels showed arteriolar narrowing foveal re reflex was altered background retina showed mottling erg showed uh, non -de non detectable or extinguished uh, here are the reports of electroretinogram showing a uh, flat uh, wave both in a uh, dark and light adaptation uh, mri brain showing a molar tooth appearance coming to leber congenital amaurosis it is a group of hereditary retinal diseases usually it is autosomal recessive it is the most severe retinal dystrophy causing blindness by the age of 1 year in most cases patient usually presents with nystagmus sluggish or near absent pupillary responses severely decreased visual equity photophobia and high hyperopia diagnosis is clinical requires thorough clinical evaluation and ophthalmic history diagnosis is supported by erg or oct 
it is characterized by at least three findings severely and early visual impairment sluggish or absent pupillary responses and severely subnormal or non detectable or extinguished erg genetic testing can also be done but since more than 30 genes are involved it is usually not done practically infants usually have normal fundus but uh, they can develop abnormalities like retinitis pigmentosa in later life in the above cases severe and early uh, visual impairment sluggish pupil reaction nystagmus showed that this is a case of lebes congenital amaurosis thank you Good afternoon. Now, a case report of plexiform neurofibromatosis. Uh, purpose to study a case of ocula periorbital plexiform neurofibroma. Introduction, neurofibromatosis type 1 has multisystem uh, neurocutaneous disorder resulting from mutation NF gene on chromosome 17, long arm 11.2. Mutation NF1 result in deficient activity of tumor suppressor protein, neurofibromin, allowing for uncontrolled constitutive activity of proliferative RAS pathway in several neural cells. This is ty types like uh, neurons, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and squamous cells. Half of NF1 are uh, inherited as autosomal dominant fashion and half develops sporadically. Syndrome has 100% uh, penetrance but highly variable expressivity. Plexiform neurofibroma arises from multiple nerves as bulging and deforming mass. Growth has nerve tissue and many different types of cells can form deep inside the body or right under the skin. Large diffuse growth with less uh, well defined border. Um, have a characteristic feeling similar to bag of worms, may uh, cause disfigurement, functional impairment, and threaten life. 5% undergo malignant transformation into M uh, MPNSGs, malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, which is extremely aggressive with dismal five-year survival rate of around 20%. The average age of onset of MPNSGs in uh, NF1 is 26 years. Plexiform neurofibroma involving eyelid, orbit, periorbital, and facial structures are termed as OPPN. Uh, uh, Associated structural finding is absence or marked reduction of sphenoid bone termed as sphenoid wing dysplasia can permit protrusion of the anterior temporal lobe, can lead to compression of optic nerve and extraocular muscles. This is a case photo showing uh, left side swelling and uh, an, uh, ex, uh, an ophthalmia. Uh, 15 year old uh, female patient came to ophthalmology OPD for visually challenged certificate. She, came, uh, she gave history of swelling on left side of face and empty socket since birth. Swelling increased in size gradually and uh, attains uh, present size. Her father is also is known a case of NF1. Uh, on examination, there was a large swelling on left side of her face. Consistency is like a bag of forms. Uh, there is left side empty socket. Uh, uh, taking consideration of diagnostic criteria developed by NIH, as there is one ocular periorbital picks from neurofibroma and one first degree related with, uh, with NF1. We diagnose the patient as neurofibromatous type 1. Um, Patient parents should uh, give genetic counseling and uh, rapid increase in size to rule out uh, MPNSTs. Repeated uh, imaging should be done. Uh, Depulping surgeries was explained. Conclusion, I re hereby report uh, OPPN. Uh, multidisciplinary team of specialists are required. Early diagnosis is crucial for patient to prevent further complication of disease. Psychological counseling and long-term follow-up is mandatory to improve quality of life. Thank you. junior resident from SB Medical College and my poster presentation is on ocular manifestation in portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is a result of increased vascular resistance in portal circulation or increased portal venous blood flow or both. Portal hypertension is a major complication of cirrhosis and its consequences including ascites, esophageal varices, hepatic encephalopathy and which leads to substantial morbidity and mortality. Coming to the ophthalmic features of portal hypertension involves xerophthalmia, vitamin A deficiency related ophthalmopathy, color blindness and retinopathy which shows soft exudates on fundus examination as a result of loss of sympathetic function of liver and hemodynamic effects of portal hypertension. So we report a case of male patient of age 42 years who was referred from medical ward and was diagnosed as decompensated liver disease with portal hypertension. Complete big blood pictures showed thrombocytopenia and ultrasound abdomen showed cirrhosis with splenomegaly. And patients were re was referred to ophthalmology department for ocular examination with chief complaints of yellowish discoloration and watering of both eyes. On examination, visual acuity of right eye is 6 by 9 and left eye it is 6 by 12. Anterior segment is normal except conjunctiva showing torturous and dilated episcleral vessels and fundus examination showing normal optic disc and with the torturous vessels and soft exudates in the general background of both eyes. Shimmer test 2 shows 5 mm in both eyes at 5 minutes. 
and rose bengal staining of both eyes shows mucin deficiency due to a decreased glow blood cell suggestive of xerophthalmia and color vision of both eyes is normal and this is the right eye picture showing uh, dilated vessels and fundus examination showing tortuous vessels and this is left eye these are the dilated episcleral vessels and middle is the rose bengal staining and fundus examination shows soft exudates thank you good afternoon everyone my name is keerthi i am here to present a case of golden heart syndrome a 10 month old male child was brought by his mother to our ophthalmology opd with chief complaint of whitish growth was noticed in left eye by mother since birth history of present illness whitish growth in left eye since birth size of swelling was initially increasing but remained stationary since 2 to 3 months there was no other significant ocular symptoms history of difficulty in feeding breathing and sleeping present since birth these were the clinical pictures on local examination face bilateral cleft lip with cleft palate and bilateral preauricular tags were present on ocular examination both eyes target fixation was present right eye anterior segment within normal limits left eye simple limbal dermoid mass of size 4 into 3 mm present at inferior temporal quadrant oval in shape white color surface of swellings normal with well defined margins both eyes fundus was normal discussion Golden Heart syndrome is also known as facio-auricular vertebral dysplasia, first and second brachial arch syndrome, or vero-cardio-facial dysostosis. It is uh, characterized by triad of anomalies comprising of epibulbar dermoid or limbal dermoid, accessory auricular appendages, and oral fistulas. Most most cases are sporadic, but familiar occurrences have been observed. Diagnosis is primary clinical based on history, examination of eye, face, and skeletal systems. Conclusion: The prognosis for this condition is good in patients with no systemic complications. Management of Golden Heart Syndrome requires a long-term commitment with treatment spanning the child's period of growth and development. Treatment should be individualized, adapted to age, as well as to the extent and severity of disease. These were my references. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. My topic is Golden Heart Syndrome. Introduction: Golden Heart Syndrome is a triad of limbal or epidermal dermoid, axillary auricular appendages, and oral fistula. Prevalence ranging from 1 is to 3,500 to 1 is to 7,000 live births. Limbal dermoid is most frequently encountered type of conjunctival choristoma. This lesion is uh, present at the birth and appears as an off-white to fleshy tumor overlying corneoscleral limbus, most commonly infrotemporally. Excision of lesion by lamellar or uh, penetrating keratoplasty can be performed if lesion is objectionable, cosmetically causing induced astigmatism with potential for amblyopia. Case report: A 15-year-old female child born out of non-consanguineous marriage came to our ophthalmology OPD with history of foreign body sensation and watering in left eye, aggravated since four days. On clinical examination, limbal dermoid in left eye, bilateral pe- preauricular tags, cleft lip, spinal spine abnormality are seen. This is the picture showing limbal dermoid and bilateral peria preauricular tags and cleft lip for which correction I- surgery is done. She is posted for limbal dermoid excision after routine surgical investigations like viral markers, uh, complete blood picture and renal profile and blood grouping and typing. Under local anesthesia and aseptic condition, surgical excision of uh, limbal dermoid was done and tissue sent for histopathological examination. This is the post-op picture of limbal dermoid day one. Histopathology rep- uh, report reveals epidermoid cyst in limbus region. Discussion: Golden Heart syndrome is also known as oculo-auricular vertebral dysplasia. It is a rare congenital defect characterized by incomplete development of ear, nose, soft palate, so lip, and mandible on usually one side of the body. It is associated with anomalous development of first and second branchial arch. Multifactorial etiology has been proposed where nutritional and environmental factors, genetic dysregulation are the causative factors. Clinical features like unilateral facial asymmetry, epibulbar or limbal dermoids, lipodermoids, coloboma, microphthalmia, strabismus anosia, microtia, preauricular tags, fistulas, defects of skull, vertebral anomalies. The diagnosis is primarily clinical. Conclusion: multidisciplinary approach is necessary for overall well-being of patient and treatment protocol should be determined. as early in life as possible to avoid physical difficulty and psychological stigma to growing child thank you
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर पी गीतिका माई टॉपिक इज ए क्लिनिकल स्टडी ऑन ऑक्यूलर मैनिफेस्टेस ऑफ कोविड नाइन्टीन एसोसिएटेड म्यूकर माइकोसिस इन जी जी एच कड़पा एम द एम ऑफ अवर स्टडी इज टू रिपोर्ट द ऑक्यूलर मैनिफेस्टेस ऑफ पेशेंट्स विद कोविड नाइन्टीन एसोसिएटेड म्यूकर माइकोसिस अडमिटेड इन जी जी एच कड़पा बैकग्राउंड दिस इज ए रेट्रोस्पेक्टिव अब्जर्वेशन स्टडी वेर द रिकॉर्ड्स ऑफ पेशेंट्स हु आर अडमिटेड ड्यूरिंग सेकेंड वेव ऑफ कोविड वेर स्टडी एंड डेटा वॉज एनलाइज Mucor mycosis is caused by the resistance of sporangiospores in paranasal sinuses, their germination and further penetration into orbits, cavernous sinus and the brain. Uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is the most common risk factor identified in patients with mucor mycosis in COVID-19. There was sudden increase in the surge of mucor mycosis cases during second wave of COVID. Till date, there are few studies reporting the ocular manifestations of CAM. So, IJ have proposed a recent staging of rhinoorbital mucor mycosis by Santosh Hanawar. in stage 1 there is involvement of nasal mucosa in stage 2 involvement of paranasal sinuses stage 3 involvement of orbit in stage 3a nasal lacrimal duct medial orbit is involved vision is unaffected stage 3b diffuse orbit involvement vision is unaffected stage 3c retinal vessels involvement of superior inferior orbital fissure orbital apex is involved there is vision loss stage 3d bilateral orbital involvement in stage 4 involvement of cns observations we have reported several manifestations of cam including ocular pain abnormalities of ocular motility proptosis ptosis eyelid edema subconjunctival hemorrhages corneal edema anterior segment inflammation raised iop and abnormalities of pupillary reaction ophthalmic artery and central retinal artery occlusion were the most common underlying etiology behind posterior segment disorders and loss of vision we have reported with 56% of patients are presented with no perception of light 15% with orbital cellulitis with proptosis 14% with ophthalmoplasia 14% with orbital cellulitis with extraconal involvement and 1% with bilateral orbital cellulitis with cavernous sinus thrombosis results out of 100 patients admitted with cam 46 patients had ocular manifestations and 96% with cam had diabetes in the present study the mean age of patients is 50 years and age range between 20 to 80 years in our study 15% are in stage 3 39% are in stage 3b 43% are in stage 3c 3% are in stage 3d conclusion knowledge of various presenting anterior and posterior segment manifestations of the disease as described in the present study will therefore guide clinicians to recognize the disease early and make every effort to prevent complications thank you Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, I am Divya Geeta, going to present a case report of compressive optic neuropathy. Pituitary adenomas are tumors of anterior pituitary, which are slow-growing and benign. Based on the size, pituitary adenoma can be classified as microadenoma, macroadenoma, and Jain tumors. Based on secretion of hormones or cell of origin, it can be classified as functional and non-functional. Presentation of pituitary adenoma depends upon the tumor size and functional status. Pituitary microadenoma is an usually an incidental finding. Macroadenoma presents with mass effects. We here report one such case of macroadenoma. 53-year-old female presented to James Ophthalmology OPD with complaints of defective vision in right eye since three months and loss of vision in left eye since four months, which was pain, uh, painless, gradually progressive, and attained the present stage. Associated with headaches occasionally since five months. No history of any previous ocular surgeries, no history of other comorbidities, and no significant personal, menstrual, and family history. General examination and systemic examination are normal. Ocular examination, head posture is normal. Facial symmetry is maintained, and extraocular movements are full in all cardinal directions. Visual acuity in right eye is 6 by 12. In left eye, no perception of light. Intraocular pressure in right eye is 13 millimeters of mercury, and left eye it is 16 millimeters of mercury. Coming to the anterior segment, right eye eyelids are normal, conjunctiva is quiet, cornea is clear, anterior chamber is normal depth, pupil normal in size and reacting to light. Lens shows early cataract changes. Left eye eyelids are normal, conjunctiva is quiet, cornea is clear. Anterior chamber is normal in depth and pupil is a normal in size with relative afferent pupillary defect, uh, which is of grade three. Lens early cataract changes are seen. Coming to the fundus, right eye media is clear. Optic disc shows disc pallor with cup disc ratio 0.5 is to 1, and vessels are normal with an IV ratio of 2 is to 3, and macula uh, we can see dull foveal reflex. In left eye media is clear, and uh, optic disc is pale with undifferentiated cup disc ratio. Vessels are normal with 2 is to 3 AV ratio, and macula FR dull. Investigations coming to the visual fields on confrontation. Right eye is decreased on the temporal side compared to the examiner, and left eye could not be assessed due to no perception of light. And on uh, perimetry, temporal hemianopia of right eye respecting the vertical meridian is seen, and left eye could not be assessed. Uh, coming to the MRI brain with orbits, it showed an evidence of uh, pituitary macroadenoma measuring 49 to 39 into 25 millimeters. 
all the serum uh, hormone levels are within normal limits. Diagnosis, this is a case of left eye optic atrophy, secondary to pituitary macroadenoma. Management case was referred to neurosurgery and transcranial resection of pituitary adenoma with duroplasty was done. Postoperatively, the patient lost vision in right eye due to extensive involvement of optic nerve. Conclusion, early presentation, early referral and timely intervention helps the patient in preventing loss of vision. Thank you. Good afternoon and everyone. Myself, uh, Dr. Sneita, postgraduate from VBMC Karnul. Today we report a rare case of two ocular malignancies in the same person, which is a very rare case entity. Sebaceous carcinoma, also known as myobian gland carcinoma, is a rare, highly malignant tumor affecting the eyelid. The lesion usually affects the upper eyelid more frequently uh, than lower eyelid because of presence of more myobian glands in the upper eyelid. MGC should be differentiated from chalazion. Uh, we should suspect MGC when there is recurrence of swelling like chalazion at the same site, especially in elderly people. BCC is the most common eyelid malignancy, accounting for over 90% of the malignant eyelid neoplasms. Due to relatively greater amount of sun exposure, BCC has more prediction for the lower eyelid, followed by the medial canthus. Basal cell carcinoma can present uh, in various, uh, can have various presentations like nodular, superficial spreading, sclerosing, and pigmented basal type. Usually MGC or BCC presents isolatedly. Uh, purpose is we report a rare case of two ocular malignancies in the same person. Uh, case report, a 65-year-old male was referred to ophthalmology OPD from oncology department in view of swelling of the right upper eyelid, which was gradually progressive for the past six months. He was admitted in the oncology department for the excision of BCC of left lower lid and lid reconstruction was done by the surgical oncology people. HP also confirmed the BCC. Regarding the right upper eyelid lesion, there was a painless bilobed swelling measuring 17 mm into 15 mm size occupying the middle upright upper uh, tarsal area. Clinically, it was diagnosed as Jane Chalazion. Incision and curettage of right upper, upper eyelid swelling was done, during which cheesy material was scooped out, supporting our diagnosis of Chalazion. After one month, again, the patient presented to us with recurrence of swelling at the same site with scanty cilia. The case was posted again and excision biopsy was done, and lid reconstruction was done, and the HP was sent and confirmed with the diagnosis of MGC. Discussion MGC has high incidence in individuals who are elderly, 50 to 70 years of age. In Asians, myobian gland carcinoma is more prevalent than BCC. The most common presentation of MGC is a solitary eyelid nodule with generalized eyelid thickening, occasionally with cilia loss and vascularization. MGC is usually misdiagnosed as recurrent chalazion. So each and uncommon or recurrent chalazion at the same site in elderly, we should always suspect MGC and send for histopath. Basal cell carcinoma is the commonest skin cancer of the eyelid, accounting for 80 to 90% of the lid malignancies. The clinical manifestations of BCC varies from person to person. In our case, the patient had superficial spreading BCC. Wide excision, cryosurgery, and most micrographic surgery are the different modes of surgeries for BCC. Usually, both these tumors occurred independently, but in our case, the patient had a presentation of MGC in the right upper eyelid and BCC in the left lower eyelid, which is a rare presentation. This is the patient clinical picture. This, the, the first picture is the patient's initial presentation, and the second picture showing uh, HP report confirming BCC. Third one is post BCC excision and lid reconstruction of low, left lower lid, and uh, the picture showing recurrence of swelling at the same site. HP confirming MGC, and final picture after MGC excision and lid reconstruction. This is the histopathology confirming uh, BCC and uh, MGC respectively. Conclusion, MGC which has uh, preference for upper eyelid and BCC which has preference for lower eyelid are commonly in elderly people. Multiple ocular malignancies in the same individuals is usually rare. So hence we are reporting both MGC and BCC in the same individual. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. Myself Manasa from PSIMSR Kuppam. Uh, going to present a case report of Down syndrome with morning glory optic disc anomaly. Uh, morning glory uh, syndrome is an uncommon and generally unilateral congenital anomaly consisting of a funnel shaped excavation of the posterior pole involving the optic disc. It is named as morning glory because of its similarity in appearance to the tropical morning glory flower and first described in 1970 by Kindler. Case report, 11 year old uh, girl with features of Down syndrome presented to the clinic of ophthalmology for regular examination with characteristic face of Down syndrome, who had previously documented trisomy 21. And she underwent a complete ophthalmo ophthalmologic and systemic evaluation to explore the associated findings. On ocular examination, facial symmetry is normal, and ocular symmetry, there is left eye isotropy of 15 degrees, 
which are like in both ICTs 5 by 60, anterior segment examination, ocular adnexia, uh, mongolioid slant is present, and decreased interpalpebral aperture. Intraocular pressures are right eye 13 mm HG and left eye 15. Uh, pupils are isocoria on normal response, and extraocular movements are full and equal in both eyes. On dilated fundus examination, right eye, the media is clear, and optic disc, there is funnel shaped optic disc uh, excavation with central glial tuft, and thin radiating retinal vessels emerging at the optic margin. Blood vessels are normal. The macula, there is dull foveal reflex and tessellated background. Left eye, media is clear. Optic disc is normal details and blood vessels are normal. Macula, dull foveal reflex and tessellated background. On V-scan ultrasonography, there, it showed a coronoid excavation in the posterior pole with optic disc in the base, whereas the posterior pole of the left eye is normal. That is the image showing the right eye uh, morning glory disc anomaly and the V-scan uh, uh, showing the optic disc ex excavation. Discussion. Morning glory syndrome is a non-hereditary and usually unilateral optic nerve disease, demonstrating the increased excavation, neuroretinal rim hypopigmentation, radial retinal vessels with glial tissue and a funnel-shaped arrangement. Etiology of this syndrome is still unknown. It is presumed to be due to insufficient closure of embryonic fissure and therefore may be a variant of optic nerve coloboma or it may be a primary mesenchymal abnormality. Conclusion. Morning glory syndrome is usually more frequent in females as in our case and most cases are unilateral but there are rare cases of bilaterality. This case report emphasizes the importance of ophthalmic screening examination in Down children to rule out any vision relevant pathology. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am Prakya from VBMC Karnul, presenting a case of rare presentation of bilateral conjunctival infiltration in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Introduction, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is most common malignancy in children. It most commonly presents with medullary involvement and includes extra medullary sites like CNS, testis, skin, subcutaneous tissue, bone, breast, head and neck. Ocular involvement usually seen in AML. It is very rare for ALL to have initial presentation as a conjunctival mass. In such situations, high index of suspicion and timely initiation of chemotherapy are very important for preservation of vision and survival. A case report, it is a 13-year-old male child who is diagnosed to have ALL, referred from pediatric oncology to our ophthal OPD, presented with bilateral swellings of conjunctiva since one month, not associated with pain, redness, no history of fever, weight loss, diminution of vision. His visual acuity is 6 by 6 in both eyes. On ocular examination, we can see 4 into 5 centimeters hard not tender mass in the superior and inferior con uh, palpebral conjunctiva in right eye and 1 into 2 centimeters hard, hard mass in superior and inferior fornix. Rest of the anterior segment and fundus examination is normal. On physical examination, the patient had pallor, has bilateral testicular swellings. Other system examination is normal. Investigations revealed hemoglobin of 7.2 grams per dl, platelets 2.9 lakhs, uh, total leukocyte count 3,500. Blood smear shows normocytic hypochromic cells. Uh, immunohistochemistry and flow, flow cytometer showed positivity for markers of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The differential diagnosis is lymphangioma and conjunctival cyst. Treatment. He was started on a three drug induction with prednisolone, L asparginase, vincristine. He did not take any active treatment for eye problem, but after two cycles of induction therapy with three drug regimen, clinically there is a complete resolution of the conjunctival infiltration. Follow up slit lamp examination revealed resolution of conjunctival mass. He is presently on maintenance therapy of, uh, of chemotherapy and doing well. This is complete uh, resolution of mass after treatment. Uh, leukemic manifestations uh, occur most often in retina. Uh, ophthalmic leukemic involvement can be a manifestation of primary or relapsed disease. Conjunctival mass has been reported as an initial presentation of ALL, relapse in childhood and in ch adults. It has never been reported as an initial manifestation of ALL. Ocular involvement is associated with a poor prognosis and increased risk of relapse. Many of ocular lesions may be asymptomatic, therefore it is important to consider ophthalmic evalu evaluation at the time of diagnosis of ALL. Conclusion, if a, if a patient presents with conjunctival mass, ALL should also be considered as one of the differential diagnoses and should be started on high-risk treatment. These are my references. Thank you.
Good afternoon everyone. Myself Dr. Sasireka, postgraduate in SP Medical College, Tirupati. Today I am going to present a case about Lawrence Moon Bardet Beadle Syndrome. So this syndrome was described to Bardet and Beadle in 1920s and Lawrence and Moon in 1866 and Hutchinson's in 1900. Lawrence Moon Bardet Beadle Syndrome is a rare autosomal recessive genetic disorder which involves multiple organ system and consanguineous marriage is usually the common cause and it affects the male and the females equally with the genetic mutation responsible for this syndrome includes BBS1, BBS2, BBS3, 4, 5, 6 up to 11 and the primary features includes progressive rod cone dystrophy, post axial polydactyly, truncal obesity, mental retardation, hypogonadism and renal abnormalities. Secondary features include speech disorder, developmental delay, diabetes mellitus, hepatic fibrosis, ataxia, short stature, facial dysmorphism, dental abnormalities, endocrine dysfunction and cardiac abnormalities. For the diagnosis of bardet beadle syndrome, four of the primary or three of the primary features and two of secondary features should be present. Case report, a 16-year-old female patient present to ophthalmology OPD with the complaints of diminution of vision for past 13 years. She was born out of full-term normal vaginal delivery and her parents had a second degree consanguineous marriage. Her parents and other siblings were found to be normal. On ocular examination, the visual acuity was 1 by 60 in right eye and 2 by 60 in left eye. With the fundus examination shows pallor of the optic disc, attenuation of the blood vessels and bony spicule pigmentation in the mid periphery of the retina which is suggestive of retinitis pigmentosa. And she also has short stature, central obesity, polydactylies that is 12 fingers and toes with mental retardation, facial dysmorphism and developmental delay. So, this is the pedigree chart of the patient showing second degree consanguineous marriage and moon spacious and polydactyly both hands and feet. And this is the fundus image showing pallor of the optic disc with the attenuation of blood vessels and the bony spicule pigmentations. So genetic counselling was advised. Thank you.